Hi, I'm Darren Kaplan from the Canicribs Horticultural Consulting Team. And today we're here to share some concepts that we discuss and implement to help commercial cannabis growers operate as efficiently and successfully as possible. Making the right irrigation decision can make the difference between a poor quality and a good quality crop. If you've been growing for months or years, you know that to be true. Today, we're gonna to talk about the fundamentals of irrigating cannabis. There's a lot of information out there in the industry about precision irrigation, crop steering, drought stress, but I'm gonna to focus today just on the fundamentals. The first most important thing to consider is that cannabis, compared to other horticultural crops, likes a dry root zone. It likes to have its roots relatively dry between irrigation events. An important concept here to understand is waterlogging. You often hear about overwatering, underwatering. That can be confusing because it can often be linked to the volume of irrigation you apply and the amount of times that you irrigate. So container capacity is the amount of water that your cube or your pot can hold after it's been completely irrigated to saturation and allowed to drain off completely. That's the most water you can have in your root zone after runoff. If you maintain that amount of water in your root zone, for an extended period of time, then you can start seeing something called waterlogging. Overwatering is often a misnomer for waterlogging. If your substrate is wet for a long period of time, that's waterlogging and you start running into issues with low root zone oxygen, you have high incidence of root zone pathogens like pythium and fusarium, and you start also running into issues with reduced nutrient uptake. Cannabis is very sensitive to these things. If you maintain your substrate at a high moisture content or waterlogged for extended periods of time, then you're gonna run into issues with crop quality, yield, and it doesn't matter what else you're doing in your grow in terms of environment or fertilizer rates, you're gonna have problems with your grow. So the ultimate goal here is to irrigate your plants completely, reach that container capacity, ideally once a day, could be more, and allow a sufficient dryback between irrigations so that the roots have time to dry out and the cannabis plants can perceive that benefits of the dry root zone. So we're looking for adequate irrigation and also adequate drybacks between irrigation. So how do you make sure that you're having adequate drybacks each day? So the first step is to match your pot size with your plant size and the growth stage. If your plant is very big in a small pot, it's gonna use the water in that pot very quickly and you're gonna have to water it very frequently, which is operationally challenging to do. It's still acceptable and you can still grow a quality cannabis plant in a small pot, but if you miss an irrigation or you miss several irrigations, you're at high risk of crop failure. If you have too big of a pot, then the plant will naturally not pull up enough moisture from the pot overnight and you'll have waterlogging conditions. So your plant will stay wet near that container capacity for an extended period of time so you'll have issues with root zone pathogens, low root zone oxygen, and nutrient uptake. And we don't want that. So you wanna be matching the size of your pot to the size of your plant to the growth stage so that you're having at least one full dry back to target moisture content that we'll discuss after every day. So for simplicity, I'm gonna break down the irrigation strategy of growing cannabis plants in containers into three phases. Phase one, two, or three, or P1, two, or three. Phase one is your first irrigation of the day. And when I say irrigation, it can actually be broken down into a number of irrigation events, often called pulses or shots, to reach a certain goal. And in phase one, that goal is to reach container capacity. So you're looking to reach container capacity starting 30 minutes to an hour after the lights are on and the plants have already begun to transpire. Remember, transpiration before irrigation. So before we start getting into phase two, remember that the ultimate goal here is that after the last irrigation of the day, the plants dry back overnight and over the rest of the day to a point that at, at P1, at the first phase, they've had enough time to dry back. Phase two is used to extend the period of container capacity so that the last irrigation of the, of the day is representative of that point that allows that proper dry back. So in phase two, we're applying pulses. It could be an irrigation every half an hour or an hour, it's up to you. The idea is that the timing of the end of P2 allows for sufficient dry back until the next P1, the subsequent day. Important to consider when you're hitting container capacity, you're hitting it to runoff. So if one plant is hitting container capacity in your crop, there might be some plants that are a little bit drier. And so to mitigate this, we try and irrigate 10 to 15% more than you would need to just hit container capacity. We call that the leaching fraction, and you wanna maintain that, depending on how safe you wanna be, between five and 20%. If you're at a point where you have enough consistency in your crop and you can start to control your leaching fraction, 
having a lower releasing fraction gives you a little bit more control of the EC and the substrate if you want to start stacking your EC or bringing the EC up. But that's more of an advanced technique that you can focus on after mastering these fundamentals. On to phase three. Phase three is the period of time from the last irrigation of P2 all the way to the first irrigation of P1. This period of time is changed, or the start of P3 is changed, so that at P1 you have a certain dryback. The dryback that you're looking for can depend on the growth stage and cultivars and your cultivation methods, but typically we like to see a dryback of 30 to 50% over the rest of the day, overnight, and to the beginning of P1. So from container capacity, the total moisture content is decreasing from 30 to 50% overnight and during P3, and that allows you to avoid waterlogging and maintain those dry conditions that cannabis likes so much. The 30 to 50% range is a wide one, and there's a lot of things that dictate if you would hit the 30% or the 50%. We start getting into crop steering here and some of the more advanced principles, but if you're somewhere between that range, you're already doing quite well. As long as you're getting that dry back overnight, you're already on the right track. So you might be thinking, why not always hit that bigger dry back, that 50% or even more? Well, the risk is that if some of your plants are having a 50% dry back, then there's other pots or containers in your crop that might be going even further. And there's some growing media, let's say rock wool for example, once it hits those really low levels of moisture, it's hard to resaturate them. And you run into issues of not being able to hit container capacity at P1 and P2 on the next day. And that might last for the duration of the crop. So it's important to balance the drybacks with the capacities of your growing media. Some are more forgiving, Coir for example, they allow you to get a little bit drier and still go back up to container capacity but that's gonna be up to you. Let's go through an example. You first transplanted your vegetative plants into let's say a three gallon cocoa pot. You're gonna apply your P1 irrigation and likely you're not gonna get down to the 30 to 50% moisture content the next day. And that's okay and that's, that's what happens after you transplant. The roots are not fully developed and the, the plants are not able to pull up all the moisture from, from the pot. There might be several days where you don't have to irrigate at all. When you start seeing that first dry back to 30 to 50%, then you have to start thinking about that P2 timing. Okay, so now you're at a point, let's say 10 days into the flowering stage, where you're seeing that you need to start extending your P2 phase. So you had a P2 of one hour, you had two shots there, and now you're a little bit farther in your crop, you need to extend that P2 by another hour. So you maintain container capacity for a little bit longer, and a little bit longer, and you keep doing that, responding to the weight of the plant, or the, or the moisture content of the plant, in the morning at P1. That moisture content in the pot first thing in the morning is what's dictating the duration of P2 and you're going to keep increasing it as the plants grow and keep using more water into the point where they start to late flowering and you'll see that you don't need to increase your P2 anymore. You might even have to bring it back because the plants aren't using as much water. The most important thing here is to reach container capacity every time you irrigate and that you link the timing of P3 with the moisture content of your pot first thing in the morning. So how do you measure the moisture content in your growing media? There's some methods that are more manual and some that are more automated. The easiest way is kind of the lift and feel method. If you irrigate to container capacity and you know you're at container capacity because you've reached runoff and you've waited, let's say, 30 minutes, you lift that plant, you know what that feels like when your plants are fully saturated. You want to bring that down, that weight down by 30 to 50% in the morning. If you have a scale, that's an even better way of doing it. You can weigh your plant at container capacity and then bring it down to 30 to 50% of, of that weight first thing in the morning. That would be your target. Or if you want a more automated approach, you can use volumetric moisture content sensors, which you put into the growing media, and they'll give you an accurate estimation of the moisture content in the container at a certain time. It's very important that those sensors are calibrated to the growing media, to the size of pot, and they're also located in the right position. Depending on the sensor you're using, you can check with the manufacturer's recommendations on how to best do this. You might already have a volumetric moisture content sensor, or you're looking at getting one and don't want to go through the process of calibration. In that case, you can still use the data that you get from the moisture content sensor to track the trends of drybacks over time, and that's still very valuable information. You can see here a figure that we've made that breaks the irrigation strategy into the P1, P2, and P3 strategies. In this example, you can see that we've administered a certain number of pulse, pulses in P1 to get up to container capacity and start off that P2 phase. In this case, we have administered three shots to keep the container capacity going so that during P3, the moisture content 
lowers to the point that we're looking for at the beginning of P1 the next day. And we continue to adjust the number of P2 shots over the crop duration so that the beginning of P1 is always at the moisture content that we're looking for. So if you look at the beginning of P1, at this point we're at 45% volumetric moisture content. That's where we were looking to be to start irrigating at this day. Something you can look at over time with these graphs is you can see that if the beginning of P1, after you've reached container capacity, if that value starts to decrease over time, you're seeing that the substrate is not able to hold as much water as it could previously. And that's common with, for example, rock wool if it's been dried back too much. It's not able to hit the initial container capacity that you were able to when you first started using it. So important there to remember is not to get too dry with those types of growing media because you reduce the amount of water that you can actually maintain in that growing media. Again, maintaining field capacity is incredibly important. There are aspects of actually how you administer the irrigation that will impact that. For example, if you're irrigating with a water breaker, you're able to fully saturate the media from the top, ensuring that every part of the growing media gets saturated. If you're using drip stakes, you're able to administer irrigation a lot more precisely, but depending on where the drippers are located and how many you have, you might leave a portion of the top of the growing media completely dry. So it's important that you're using, like usually at least two stakes, if you're, if you're looking at a pot of, point f of half a gallon or larger. And if you're using emitters that have too high of a flow rate, then you start running into channeling, where the water flows through the pot and doesn't actually saturate the growing media, but runs straight through to drain. So a slow, controlled irrigation approach with drippers is a great way to fully saturate your growing media and hit container capacity without channeling. If you're using dripper stakes, make sure that they're not overly pushed into the growing media. So maybe 40 to 50% of the top of the stake is sticking out. That way you don't get channeling starting halfway down your growing media. If you're interested in having Canacribs Consulting assist in designing, building, or optimizing your facility, please fill out the intake form in the description below. Even if your operation is running well, we can be a sounding board for fine-tuning your facility, educating your team, or streamlining your processes. We work worldwide, and our team consults in five different languages. If you're interested, reach out to us and we can quote you on our services.